All right, here we are. Another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is Josh Todd from Buck Cherry here today. What's going on, buddy? What's happening? Uh, lots going on, you know. Thank you for having me, first uh, First of all. And um, yeah, we're about to drop our 10th record here, Volume 10, J uh, June 2nd, and super excited. I go way back with the band. I remember, shit, I think it was like early 99 or something. Bruce Boulier was, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, uh, such a good guy. Love him. Yeah. And he was if, like, if you If you see him, please tell him I said hello. Yeah, I will. I, I see him once yeah. in a while in Vegas when I do shows out there. He comes Oh, out. is he living there? Yeah, he lives out there in Vegas. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, that's that brings cool. back like a lot of great memories. That's where all the old rockers seem to move. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of guys living out there for sure. But, you know, I remember uh, he got in my car and he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm working with this band sparrow check them out they got a buzz yeah. he put it on and he played at the movies and i was like yeah oh, that sounds <laughs> incredible you know yeah. and then i started uh digging into it you guys were it was interesting because you guys were kind of uh lighting it up in a time that was just right as grunge was starting to kind of fade a little bit again you know yeah. It was uh, it, it was like, you know, you had the Sunset Strip booming and then grunge came and then that kind of, uh, you know, faded off a little bit. And then you guys come out and yeah, it's kind of like this bolt of lightning again down there. Everybody's like, oh, shit, rocks back, you know? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I just remember there was a lot of uh, rap rock going on at the time. You know, that was pretty big at the time when we first dropped our first record and um we were kind of like this different thing you know on our own little uh island and uh it just it just worked you know we had the right song at the right time at that time with uh lit up and it reacted with people and thank god yeah i think it was like spin or rolling stone did a little blurb on you guys too about how this cocaine song was you know yeah. around yeah. and la labels were coming around at what point did the label start coming around because that's kind of at the end of also the quote unquote big a and r guy like the Kalogners and those kind of guys that were snipping around rick rubens that would come around you'd be like oh shit a and r guys you know right yeah they used to be a big thing now now it's like there's n none of that anymore but uh yeah michael goldstone signed us uh to he's a big a and r guy he signed uh Pearl Jam and Rage Against the Machine, you know, um, which are, you know, huge acts. And um, it was a very exciting time. I can tell you how it all happened. I mean, uh, at that time, you know, we were starving musicians in L.A. And uh, the bass player and I at the time were working a phone gig, you know. And so we used the phone lines at our work to basically manage the band. And so what we our, our whole thing was we we booked shows up and down the coast of California you know, and stayed out of LA. And we kind of built up this buzz around LA, you know, so that once we, you know, the plan was to like build up the buzz around LA. So we would go down and play San Diego and then we'd go out and play Monterey and then we would go down and play Orange County. And, you know, and there started, we would start getting these fan bases in these areas. And then eventually there was a buzz going on. And we're like, okay. We, we, we spoke to this entertain, entertainment attorney, uh, Alan um, Mintz, and he's not alive anymore. God bless him. He was a great guy. And, and so um, we, uh, we met with him. We got a plan together. He goes, okay, let's do like five shows in LA and I'll get everybody there. And you guys got to pack them. And you know how hard that is. It's super Impossible. hard. Yeah, it's super hard to pack uh clubs consecutively in hollywood you know so that's why we did all this work around it so that we had a show at, at the viper room and it was sold out and we had given out at all of our shows we gave out these two song demos of for free and i think one of it was lawless and lulu and i think lit up was on there i'm not sure i know i know lawless and lulu was on there but we sold out the viper room and every uh, a and R guy was there, right? And managers, and you know, and then all, and, and then VC or Sparrow fans at the time. And um, when we played Lawless and Lulu, 
people were singing the chorus as if we were in an arena, you know, they, they had all, they all knew it. And so the a and guys were looking around the room and they're like, I can't believe this. This is a local band with no record. And these people know the songs, you know? So I think that was a real big selling point. In fact, I know it was after talking to Michael at, you know, Goldstone after the fact. And then, and then we played another showcase at the whiskey and it was incredible. Another night like that where it was sold out and it was just bananas, you know? And then we were, I just remember walking up the street from the whiskey with the, the band guys uh, and Michael Goldstone uh, just walk up to us and he goes, Hey guys, I'm Michael Goldstone. And we go, we know who you are, you know? And he's like, uh, yeah, I was wondering if you guys would like to do a record together. And we were like, fuck yeah, we want to do a record together. And that was like, right when DreamWorks had started, you know, and um, and the rest is history. That's what happened. It's funny too, because what you just said, yeah, we know who you are. There were these guys and we knew who they were. And when they came in the room, it was almost like they were rock stars. It's like, oh my God, fuck it. You know, Tom Wally's here or, you yeah, know, yeah. these dudes, Mike, or uh, uh, what's the guy that signed uh, GNR? Um, Fuck, I forget his name. But, you know, these guys would be... Tom Zutat. Yeah, Zutat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they would be... We, we, he him. just came to one of our shows just recently in uh, in Tennessee. Lovely guy. Yeah, I heard he's living out there selling cars or something. Yeah, he sells Kias. That's fucking yeah. wild, dude. Yeah, he's a cool dude. He is, man. I mean, I mean... But that was the kind of the last of the era of those guys. And just to think, too, also, like a big record deal, DreamWorks at the time had a huge buzz also. They were this new label, a super yeah. label. So to be on yeah. that label and then have Terry Date do the record, who had done Soundgarden and, you know, and all these great, great records, that's just uh, like a perfect storm, you know? Yeah, it was a, it was a really cool time for us everything was new you know we had never been on a major label you know we had never had a hit song you know we had a hit song with lit up and all those things it was you know we gave dreamworks their first gold record of that label which was pretty special you know and here we were this rock band you know like so uh uh we are just uh really enjoying the time period for sure after he says, let's do a record, were there other people uh, coming into the game? Was there a bidding war? That kind of stuff, like old school. We'll give you $1 million, you know? Uh, I, Alan Mintz handled all that kind of stuff. And I think there was a couple other guy, people at the table. I can't remember specifically, but, um, you know, Goldie was who we really wanted, you know? And it, and, uh, it all worked out, you know? Um, it was just the right fit. It, I hadn't really heard of anything happening like that. It's funny after that happened, Buck Cherry gets signed and you start making records and stuff. It doesn't really happen again until Shooter's band, Stargun. It seemed like every five years or so, a rock band would happen and people would be like, rock, you know? Because <laughs> that same thing, I remember they're playing Viper Room. There's a million people there into them and, and you um. know. They they were straight up rock and killing it, but it was so hard for rock to even to even you know fathom getting a record deal and a draw after what happened in the eighties. You know, yeah, we've seen a lot of them come and go. I, I gotta say, we've been out, we've been doing it uh, twenty four years now, and it's you've seen a lot of them. One record out, two two records out. You know, like it's it's a it's um, only a small percentage. Uh, can have longevity for sure yeah it's a grueler for sure i was i was surprised i went to the uh time bomb uh tour show i remember quite well i was on the bus uh, i knew yogi and you guys played yeah. dog pound in san fran which is just a shit venue and i was like <laughs> i immediately was like this is this band's over you know if you're playing here something went wrong and right. after that gig i think <laughs> you guys were done uh yeah that was a that was a tough tough touring cycle you know i mean i could sit down and give you all the reasons why it happened like that but um you know it happened and uh we weathered the storm and you know we took a little hiatus and made the biggest record of our career you know with uh 15. 
when you guys uh, kind of go on hiatus, semi break up after Time Bomb, which by the way, uh, I thought I thought that was uh, for me was the record. I thought it was better than the first one for me. I liked. Rock. I did too. I did too. It's a yeah. it's a great record, and I always tell like real Buck Cherry fans like you got to get you got to find that long lost record, and that's Time Bomb. You know, it's a great record. It really is, and the videos. It's fucking great. mean too. It mean. is. I like it's it. a goddamn rock record. Uh, yeah, that is. Car riding is fantastic, man. It, it was just yep. when that song came out. I was like, oh, these guys got some fucking great songs, you know? Um, yeah. I but, sang Riding and Porno Star this morning. Yeah. Great, great shit. And then Place in the Sun was great. Great song. Now, I've been in the business, so I understand once you go on hiatus and everything, and you kind of go away. Was there some long red tape before you do 15, you know, uh, as far as being hell? Yeah, off? there was every every obstacle you can think of was thrown at us for that for that record. It's a miracle that it happened. You know, um, everybody was telling us what we couldn't do, you know, and so um, we just stayed focused on the beacon and, and just kept hustling, you know, and it, the reasons the reason it's called 15 is because no one would sign us uh, in the United States. And we got a small record deal in Japan and we had a small budget and we made it in 15 days. Now, when, when you guys, no one would sign you, is that because they would have to pay your back end like deal from DreamWorks, like buy you from DreamWorks? How did that happen? No, nope. no, nope. uh, no, we, we were out of our deal and just became uh, we got the. Uh, you guys are, you know, over and whatever, whatever their excuse was. And, and so our manager stepped up Alan Kovac at the time. And he's like, you know what? Fuck all this. I'm going to start, I'll, I'll start my own label and you guys will be the the first record. And, and we'll, we'll do a, we, we, we got a distribution deal through Atlantic and they had an upstreaming clause in there if they wanted it at some point. And we released it on 117 Music, which was Alan Kovacs label that is now a, a pretty big independent label now, you know, with lots of other bands, you know, and uh, and of course, Crazy Bitch started happening and then everybody wanted to be our friends again. No, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's the everybody. Everybody wanted to be in the Buck Cherry business again. Yeah. Imagine that. That's Hollywood, man. <laughs> yep. Oh, we can make some money. Hey, buddy, we've always loved you, man. We, that, you know, we just yeah. couldn't figure out how to make it work. Yeah, <laughs> you guys, now that it's easy, we want in. Uh, my whole idea, I, I listen to a lot of hip hop, so I just wanted it to sound like a hip hop song, you know, but, in, but with rock, I wanted it to have a lot of space and groove and very simple. And uh, it's crazy the life that that song has had. Yeah, when we never would have thought that it was going to be like that. I mean, you could actually, this is the crazy thing I was thinking about. You could have no records out before that and still tour the rest of your life because of that song. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I wouldn't want to do that, but... Uh, no, I understand you, that, but I'm saying you the could, power you, of a I think you song. could, yeah, you could go do some shows, but you couldn't tour extensively. You know, you'd have to, you have to keep putting out records, but... um. Yeah, I mean that's that's what's great about hit songs. We always want a hit song, you know, for sure, because that that's exactly what you're talking about. It gives you um, that platform to continue to go out there and make a living at this. You know, that's what it's all about. Uh, I did notice one thing when I saw you guys. Um, I was on the bus on the Time Bomb tour, just hanging out, and you had a pretty uh, vigorous warm up thing. I've sang for years and years and years. Uh, at first, when you first start singing, you're just singing like, you know, a, a gig a week or whatever and at rehearsal. But once you get on tour, do you immediately try to uh, find a great vocal coach and figure out warming up and warming down and all that stuff? Well, yeah, it's a whole different ball game, you know. Um, I really self-taught myself all the way through the first record and the first tour. So since I was 15, you know, and I created a lot of bad habits. And this was before in-ear monitors and all that, you know, and uh, my ears were starting to get really fatigued from uh, the noise on stage. And 
I was blowing my voice out a lot on that first record tour and I needed help, you know, and I got a vocal coach, um, uh, Don, what was his last name? I forget his last name. Uh, or, and then I, I went to a lot of different people until I finally, uh, landed on, uh, Mark Baxter. He's my guy and I, I really love him. And, um, now I'm a real student of vocal technique and, it's hard for me to listen to the first record because I just, I just hear how underdeveloped I am vocally. And, you know, um, and I, I, I continue to constantly work on my voice to this day, especially when you get older, you got to work harder and you always find new, new little uh, areas of your voice that are, you know, if you're constantly working on it, you know, and uh, I warm down now too. I've been warming down for years. So not only do I warm up, I do a show and then I warm down after a show, you know, what is a warm down? Because that seemed to happen after I stopped singing. You're know, warming up, of course, but a warm down. I, I'm trying to figure out what is that? Yeah, the whole theory behind it is like you have your speaking voice and then you have your singing voice. You know what I mean? And so you warm up with scales to, to get your body and your voice, everything ready to go out there and, and perform. And then you go out there and perform and you're basically – you're in your singing voice, you know? So warming down is just somewhere where I get off stage and then I just vocalize for about eight minutes, which is just doing some some light scales until uh, I'm back to my speaking voice, you know? And that's really the whole thing behind it. And, you know, once you start doing that, and it's like, it's the next day and the next morning where you really feel a difference, you know? And then you don't ever want to not do it, you know? Yeah, that's wild. Did you ever uh, get any nodes or anything? No. Yeah, yeah. Lucky, you know. And I, I haven't sang with in ear monitors. I I was like you in the era of just side fills and and monitors and bad monitor guys with feedback and just trashing your ears and stuff. How great is it to sing with the in ear monitors? It's uh, a game changer. I'll, I'll never sing without them, you know, because you can really dial in your mix to where there's only stuff that you want to hear. You don't, you don't have any, like, I don't have like symbols and all kinds of stuff that really fatigue your ears. I don't have, I don't even have an audience in my, in my ears. You know, I don't have backup vocals in my ears. I just have, I just have drums, you know, bass, guitar, and my vocal yeah, man, I, I, I'd i like to try it out, you know, because when you're singing in the studio, you know, you got cans on and you could just you don't have to like trash your voice. You could just sing in this great volume and everything. You're not trying to get over Marshall Stack, especially when you guys. That's the thing. That's a, that's the thing. It really saves your voice. And the coolest part about in-ear monitors is you can walk anywhere on a stage. So say you're on an arena stage and you go all the way to the left and all the way to the right. It all sounds the same wherever you're at on stage, you know, and then you go, then you go play a club gig and it's the same. And then you go play a, a theater and it's the same, you know, or, they're very small tweaks, but you know what I mean? And now, now guitar players are on simulators now where they don't even have, we don't even have guitar amps on stage anymore, which is amazing because it even cuts down more noise. So you can even dial it in even better. And it's just, it's so great for singers for sure. Yeah, absolutely. When you were coming up, uh, you know, like we we're talking about, you were talking about hip hop. I loved hip hop. I still do. But it was wild, yeah. right? What happened? We just had like, you know, of course we know like Sugar Hill Gang and that was really coming around. Rapper's Delight. And then you start getting some of the stuff, uh, Run DMC, uh, Public Enemy being my favorite. And then it comes with nwa and it's a whole game changer for years right what was yeah it yeah nwa was really uh uh where it was at for me i mean when that when straight out of compton hit and i was in orange county california surfing and skateboarding and uh all the all the kids were listening to that record you know it was really huge and i just remember as a kid putting out on that record i'm like damn this is so fucking dangerous this is so rad you know like it just felt like for me like it was these young guys talking about what was going on in their lives in the hood you know and i and i was like it was something that i had no knowledge of so 
as a kid, it was um, just really awesome to listen to it and to be close to that, you know, without knowing who they were, you know? So, uh, and that's what it was for all of us, you know? Um, so we did everything to the, the straight out of Compton record, you know, we would skate to it and, you know, we would jam it in the car and, you know, put it on at parties and it was a huge record for us. Yeah, it was, it was massive. That one. And for me, fear of the black planet, you know, I just thought that, yeah, that was great. Oh my and God. then that's when I got into everything after the fact. I didn't even know Public Enemy at that time. Yeah. And then all that stuff later. And then, of course, the masterpiece. And, and you know, I got in. I, I was I was really into the Ghetto Boys back then. Oh, yeah. The Ghetto Boys. Yeah, they, they were great. Just classic. There was so much great hip hop that if you think yep. about it, it's wild. Some people just have like one or two records. And but you put them on and you go, God damn, this shit was and it was dangerous. It, it, you know, it was dangerous. It was, it was awesome, you know. And uh then you had Easy E and Ice Cube, they did their thing, and then Dre did his, his thing, and then Tupac, you know, was it was amazing, you know, and then and then Biggie, you know, like all oh, such a great uh transition and time period for hip hop for sure. And there's a lot of great stuff now, you know. I, I just I listen to hip hop all the time and pop music. Yeah, same. Yeah, I listen to the Eminem uh, Sirius channel, and it's always like, <laughs> oh, this shit is this shit is great. They just play crazy stuff, you know. And it's yeah. half the time I don't even know who it is. I just roll it, and I'm like, this is great, you know. Yep. Yep. And now you and Stevie D, like, there was a time where um, Buck Cherry kind of fell apart again after Keith leaves, and you do a hip hop thing with Stevie D, right? Oh, we did a lot of stuff. We did a, we did a EP called Spray Gun War, which was like electronic and rock. Like it was, it was a lot of fun for us. That was like the first, you know, Stevie D is a really talented guy and he never got an opportunity to shine because of the politics of the band at the time, you know? And so we did the, we did the Spray Gun War EP and then we did uh Josh Todd and the Conflict Year of the Tiger record, which was an amazing record. And me and Stevie wrote that whole thing. And, and so we were getting our songwriting language together and uh, cut to the first uh, Buck Cherry record with he and I um, running the show was uh, War Paint and had a lot of fun making that record. And then, you know, uh, Hellbound and Volume 10, in my opinion, are the best Buck Cherry records, you know, to date. You know, they we we co-wrote all the songs, uh, most of them with Marty and me and Stevie and Marty and um it's it's amazing from top to bottom let me ask you a little bit about your dancing because that was one thing that really blew me away like uh you know it seemed like when i was coming up you had some steven tyler had kick-ass moves and then you had you know um richard from uh shark island and then you got that whole gnr you know axel did he take the dancing with the snake shit but dude started yeah. dancing and as a front man you're like well, fuck, now I got to dance too? I'm like this bad white guy. I, I'm like biker rock, you know what I mean? You're, I'm out there trying right. to whatever. But man, you you fucking had some sick moves, still do. Was uh, Did you go to some dancing coaching and stuff also? I mean, it had to be the whole package, right, as a front man. You know, um, I have an older sister. She's two and a half years older. And um, when I was a kid, you know, I had my my records that I listened to, which was a lot of punk rock records and, and all that, but I, I'm a fan of music and I would sneak in her room and she had Billy Idol, Prince, Apollonia six, Sheila E, uh, you know, Yaz. I was a big fan of the Yaz record upstairs at Eric's. So anyways, I would go in there and listen to it. And she was all into going out to clubs and dancing, you know? So, um, I got a fake ID when I was 17 and I would start going to clubs with her and I started dancing. So I would be like this little punk rock surfer skateboarder kid during the week. And then I would go dancing with my sister uh, at like dance clubs in Orange County, you know, and I really enjoyed that. So dancing's always been a part of my thing. You know, um, I really love funk music as well. And, uh, you know, I like very soulful rock and roll music. And I think that's what's missing in, in rock is, is soul, you know, um, and, you know, I bring all those elements into Buck Cherry stuff and Buck Cherry performances. And, yeah, it's just part of me. I think that's what's missing in music in general is uh, a full-blown soul 
like 70s type of uh, bands where they played soul and played instruments, uh, talking earth. Wind well, you know, thank God. Thank God for Bruno Mars, because Bruno Mars is uh, really special. And thank God for him, because he is uh, he's legit in every aspect. He's like the king right now, you know, um, just an amazing talent. But isn't it wild we can only name maybe one uh, when you look at like the 70s of like Earth, Wind and Fire, Lakeside, you know, uh, right. Parliament, Funkadelic, that, in, I mean, that yeah. entire Soul Train era of just fantastic musicians and crushing songwriting. And it's just, right. just not around. It's wild. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's because technology made it really easy for people to half measure it and you know put out music you know what i mean uh back then you're talking about all you know even disco back then was like played by live bands you know they had to, they had to go out and play li like donna summer was amazing live and she had a live band playing disco and it was incredible you know so um you know now it's uh people go out and they're just you know some of them are even lip syncing the tracks. You know what I mean? It's just all tracks and there's not a whole lot of spontaneity and soul and, and that kind of stuff, you know, but I mean, Bruno uh, still does that. You know, he has a great live band and live situation. He's an incredible dancer and performer and songwriter and singer and all that. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I, I mean, I fell in love with D'Angelo and, uh, you know, he was great. Yeah. Oh. God, guys, just a smoker and Maxwell. Remember him? Oh my God. Amazing. Macy Amazing. Gray. All this shit was just like, there was soul going on then, man. I mean, just a run of them. Yeah. I saw D'Angelo way back in the day at the House of Blues, uh, sold out. And it was like, it was a love fest in there, man. Everybody was dancing everywhere in that place. It was amazing. Yeah. D'Angelo is a God. And of course, the Bee Gees for me, uh, Saturday Night Fever. Amazing. Amazing. That, that stuff's next level to me. That soundtrack, that film, yep. the dancing, the clothing, the music. It's nuts, man. You got good taste. <laughs> it's all my same, same taste as me. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's just it comes down to good songs. That's what it comes down to. It does. It's all about the song, you know, and that's and that's where we're at to this day. It's like we just do what's best for the song. And that's why the records are so good right now. So you did the new record again in Nashville at, with Marty. Yep. It's the third one yep. with Marty, right? No, second full record with Marty. I mean, no, Marty produced some records like Back Butterfly and uh, I'm trying to uh, Confessions and um, and we, he co-wrote Sorry with us back in the day. But this, these are the first two records that we've just done uh, just with him from top to bottom. And, you know, he and I and Stevie writing the uh, majority of the music together. And it's just amazing. And now you got my old friend Billy in the band, Billy Rowe from Jet Boy. Such a wonderful guy. Really, really good dude. It's so funny because when I was young, Billy and Jet Boy moved to L.A., and I was a band in San Francisco. And that was a big deal when you're young and you, I mean, that's when you can make a big move like that, but it's also scary as hell. And then they came back after a while, you know, to the Bay Area. But uh, eventually I moved to LA and my entire life changed from just a 300 mile move, you know? And now right. I'm doing comedy, it's just bizarre. And I talked to Billy a lot at night, you know, and I'd be like, yeah, dude, just get out of there. San Fran is completely done, you know? And I'm like, you gotta yeah. get out of there. This is in LA, you can just walk around and anything can happen, man. You gotta be in the river if you're panning for gold, you know? And, he moved, <laughs> yeah. and his guitar company, Rock and Roll Relics took off and then bam, he lands a gig in Buck Cherry and it's just fucking yeah. crazy how people's lives can change. Yeah, he's really renewed my faith in uh, musicians, you know? I mean, he's uh, he's like a really lovely guy, you know? And he's in it to win it, and he never complains. And he's a, he's a world-class player and a very professional guy and all those things, you know? And then he has his own his own uh, business as well who, that he's really talented at. And um, 
what can I say? You know, we found a gym. Were you aware of Jet Boy or did somebody recommend him to you? How'd that go down? Stevie knew him and we, you know, we had a, uh, we had a situation and we had to address it. And he's like, I know this guy, you know, and I'm like, it's at this point, it wasn't even about like, okay, he's done Jet Boy and we know he can play guitar, you know, I, but it's really about the person because at the end of the day, you got to be in tight quarters with, uh, you know, these people, your, your musicians and, and you got to basically live with them, you know, I mean, that's what people don't uh, really realize. And, and we had been through our run of, you know, situations in this band. So, you know, I was very gun shy. So um, I said, let's just go to breakfast, you know, let's just have a talk, you know? And so that's what we did. You know, Stevie was really championing him, said he's a really good guy and really liked him. And it's, and it was important for me, for Stevie to have, that good you know camaraderie between him and another guitar player because that's that's a big deal you know so i go so let's let's go to breakfast so we went to breakfast um in toluca lake and it was me billy and stevie and it was just a lovely time you know billy was just a really great guy he came off uh like somebody that i just could really jive with from the get-go he's very nice person and um, and that was what was so important for me, you know, and I, we left there and I go, I'm fine with him. If you're fine with him, let's, let's get going. And then it was just about like, you know, I told, I told Billy, I go, you know, we don't really know who we got until they're two years deep in this band. That seems to be the, that seems to be the pattern that's gone on with us. You know, it's like people don't really show their true colors until they're about two years deep. And then we get all the, the stuff we get you know uh people bitching because they're they're on the road too long or prima donnas or wh whatever you know you name it you know uh so he's like he goes i understand and that was it you know and he's been in the band over two years and he's just solid as the day day one you know and it's just been going great yeah that's great man I, we've been friends i think i don't know 38 years or something so it's wild uh, and now you're out on this great, successful Skid Row Buck Cherry co-headlining tour. Hey, hey, what kind Sorry. of dog you got? Uh -huh. It's a King Charles Cavalier. Oh, this is Lion. Lion. Whoa, yeah. he's got a, does he got a blue eye? He's got one blue eye, like Bowie. Yeah, he's, that's right. He's, uh, lovely. Okay. Yeah. You hear that, Gertie? Well, my dog's looking. looking <laughs> who's barking? <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, anyway, dogs. yeah, we, you guys we are, all love dogs. I love it. I love it. You guys are out on the uh Skid Row Buck Cherry tour. That's growing great. They keep adding dates. That's pretty damn cool. And uh, and you guys, yeah, are, yeah, yeah. And you're a regular at the fucking uh, at the Sturges, which is pretty cool, man. That's always wild to play. Yeah, they need to build us a house out there. We played there so many times. <laughs> <laughs> now, the records hit when's the record come out in June, right? Yeah, the record comes out June 2nd. You can pre-order it right now. Um, you can get like three or four songs if you pre-order it right now already. And um, we're hitting on all cylinders, you know. Uh, got a lot of lot of touring ahead of us and come out to the live shows. It's going to be great. Yeah, congrats on everything. I know how fucking hard it is touring. I just got off a two-month tour. The buses are triple the money. The gas is a fortune. The rooms are <laughs> a fortune. It's just... Right. It's just fucking loony out there, man. It is crazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, people don't understand how expensive it is to tour. It's a, it's a lot of money. It's worse than ever, you know? Yeah. You guys yeah, but you just, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta just navigate through it and, and work through it. And that's, you know, we always do that. We've, we've been through it all. You guys watch some comedy on the tour bus? Uh, yeah, I'm always, we all, I'm always watching comedy, uh, you know, watch, we love watch a lot of stand up on Netflix and, uh, Amazon prime, the stand up, you know, always, I love stand up. Who's your guys? Uh, honey, who's the last guy we, uh, Mulaney. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, the cocaine John, one. John Mulaney. Yeah. The, yeah. It was amazing. The cocaine yeah, one. Basically That's a drunk log. We love Seb Sebastian Maniscalco, you know, um, uh who's the uh i'm drawing a blank right now oh bill 
Bill uh, Burr. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's really great. Really great. Yeah. He's fantastic. You got to come yeah. down to the comedy store cool. sometime, man. I would love to. Let me know. You know, last time uh, my wife and I went down there, just uh, we just went into the main room and Maniscalco came up there. He was he came up and did like 15 minutes. We were like, oh, my God, it's amazing. You know, it was uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's like that every night. You're going to get an Ali Wong, Sebastian, you can get Burr, and then you got me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great. I, you know, I tip my hat to you. It's, it's, uh, it takes a, it's a hustle and you got to be good. And, you know, the writing and everything, I, I love it. I think it's a, it's a, an amazing thing. You know, I don't know. Did you see the, the HBO Max special on George Carlin? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. The documentary. Yeah. Yeah, Judd Apatow did it. It's two parts. It was so incredible. Great. I was a huge, like, I was really in a dirty comedy when I was a kid, and like Sam Kinison and and George were huge for me when I was a kid. Yeah, it's wild to think too that you know I had no idea. I saw Carlin when I was young, and I was a huge fan. You know, I remember I saw him, and he he was just like uh, he had this thing. He had his way with words, but he was just like, the fart is always funny, no matter what. The fart is funny. Yeah, you know? yeah. And he had that baseball yeah. who's on for, you know, baseball and football, that kind of thing. Uh, but Yeah, but when you see the scope of all the transitions he made as a, as a comic and the fact that he wrote all his stuff, he is just an extraordinary talent, uh, you know, just in, amazing. Yeah, and just specials every year and, you know, and, yeah. and almost like a uh, kind of like a one man show and, and, and all that stuff he's talking about, the politics and everything then is right now the same shit. His head would pop off if he is alive. He'd be like, still the same shit. You know, I, I always say that I was like, I wish Carlin was alive to do a special on what's going on today. He would just kill it. It would be amazing. You know, the last Chris Rock special was really great, too. Yeah, there's a, we're in a, the second boom, uh, golden age of comedy again, man. And it's uh, it, it feels like old school rock and roll, you know, because you're in this room yeah. and there's not phones allowed in there. So you don't have people with their fucking phones in your face. That was a tough thing for me as winded down as a musician was just people not engaged in the crowd with the rock. They yeah. were just filming it. And, you know, I know in the days when you and I would go to concerts, I remember every fucking thing, the clothing, the song they opened with, the guitar changes, yeah. the opening band, because I didn't have any phone. It was all senses going into my brain, you know? And I remember them to this day and they're the greatest memories I have. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely changed a lot. And as a musician, you got to just kind of tune that out because you're not changing it, you know? Yeah. Well, we tour a lot now with the Yonder Bags. Have you played any gigs where the Yonder Bags, where the phones are in the bags? It's night and day different, man. The people are so on. Oh, no. Oh. Yeah, you put they, they put their phones in a bag and they're kind of locked up by a magnet and they can open them if they go outside of the uh, the, the venue. Oh. And man, it is. A yeah, never, never heard of that. Oh, yeah. You yeah that's cool. One day you're going to play a gig and they're going to have them. And you're going to be like, holy shit, it's 1984 in here. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's well, cool. hey, man, it was great talking to you. And uh, we're neighbors. Hopefully I'll see you one day around town and uh, come to the store anytime. Hit up Billy, get my info and, and we'll hang out. I will. I will for sure. That'd be cool. I'd love to support and, and just come check you out. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I went and saw you. I'm a huge yeah. fan. I saw you about a year ago at the whiskey and it was fucking smoking, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. We should be playing LA uh, pretty soon. I think uh, we're playing the Henry Fonda theater or some, some place in LA. So with the skid row uh, package, so you should come out. Yeah, for sure. I'll come out and give everybody where your tour dates and stuff. So uh, buckcherry.com. At buckcherry.com. Yeah. You can pre-order and do everything there and get the tour dates and it's a one-stop shop for sure. And they got the new videos out right now. Good time. Let's get wild. Shine your light. They're all on YouTube. Shine your light. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and uh, oh, yeah. one last thing. 
I remember you guys did a video and I was invited to the shoot, but I was on tour. But my buddy Kevin went Hollywood Jesus. You remember that video in the church? Hollywood Jesus. That was the gluttony. Yeah. Yeah. The, the song was gluttony. And I was just talking about that guy the other day. He passed away. Yeah, he passed away, man. So yeah. sad. He was just a solid. Too bad. He solid was a very human. nice guy. Very nice guy. Beautiful man. Hanged out at the comedy store yeah. every night. He was just, I mean, that guy was beautiful, man. Yeah. Cool dude. I miss it's, him. It's very sad. Anyway, thanks a lot for doing the show. And uh, I'll see you soon. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Good thanks, interview. Josh. I'll see you. Take care, everybody. And good luck with everything. Stand up thanks. and everything. You too, man. See ya. Cheers.